I want to thank you, Aisha, for motivating me to make this live video. Yeah, and I want to invite some friends. I was skeptical about making this video, but I thought of something. And I said, no, I'll make it. During the 2015 presidential election, I, I made a post, anti-Bwari's post and anti-Jonathan post. I was surprised that the post were deleted and my account was suspended for three days. So that was when I understood the power of social media. You come out, you express your feelings, you express your ideas. You might think they're not watching you, but all these politicians, they are watching clearly what is going on. So, and then I discovered that most of my friends who were Christians before, we were influenced by some of the posts we made. And uh, some of them now are abandoning Christianity and they're becoming atheists. So I discovered that social media has a lot of influence and power over a lot of people. So keeping quiet about these killings, I don't think is a better option. So I decided to add my voice to this. Thank you, Aisha. I see you around. You motivated me to make this video, so I will try my best to talk about it. See, I was born in Plateau State. In Plateau State, in a specific village, they call it Panyam. That's the city where I was, this little village where I was born. So, and seeing how beautiful that city, that state is, is the, I think it's one of the most coolest states in, in Nigeria, apart from Calabar. Very cold. You will see so many French people. You will see so many Europeans there because of the weather. Very cold weather. They have a very cool environment. And practically every single fruit you consume in Nigeria comes from Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. Over I'm seeing you. Yes, so seeing this beautiful state in Nigeria that has been destroyed by... Uh, mind you, this crisis didn't start today. It started since 2007. I almost lost some family members who we are, became almost victim of all these things, but they were saved by a Muslim family. So we're directly implicated, directly affected by this crisis, and it's a very sad development and as it is going right now. So when I saw the reaction of the Nigerian government, was I happy? I'm not sure I was happy because let me tell you what that means, the state of emergency in, in JOS. Nigeria is a country of 2 million people. I say 2 million, 200 million people, but... Do you know how many military personnel we have? We have only 125,000 military personnel. 125,000 military personnel for to to protect two mil, 200 million population. How would that work? There is no way it will work. 100 and at least let's have at least maybe 500,000 at least a million military personnel. That would be cool for the country, but nope. That's not what we have. Only 125,000 military personnel, I think 50,000 reservists, that's what we have. And our naval force, our Navy force, they are not even well equipped. And what we don't understand is that as a sovereign nation, as a state, we need three powers. We need at least three key things to secure a country. First of all, is our maritime territory and our airspace and our territorial border, our land borders. So our government is supposed to keep this territory safe and secure for our citizens. So the people that are dying in just this crisis have been going on for a very long time. And what did the government do? What they did recently, I saw that Obasanjo visited the state in just state to, to, come to, to pay a visit to the government. And what happened? The vice president visited the state and the president came again. But don't be scammed, Nigerians. Don't be scammed. This is what they do. They employ military personnel, they go in there, they stop them. But you don't know the effect of the presence of all those armies that are there. Let me tell you what happened. Whenever army are being deployed in a specific area, it's a huge mess. It's a huge fiasco, such mission. One, let me tell you what they do. They set up roadblocks road in every road and they do check up. They stop cars to check those, some of those cars. And when they are checking some of those cars, they ask some of those drivers to give them 50 naira, 100 naira, or though they ask you to give them water. Because why? Because some of those militaries are ill-paid. They, they're not well-paid. Some of them abandon their family, their wives, their children, their relatives from far east, far south to come to be deployed to this part of the country. What did they do? They come into this part of this country and they are, they are men. They have all, they have sexual order that they need to satisfy. What they do is that the vic their victim become the locals. The youngest in the community, they get raped. They get abused, they get molested, and nobody 
crime against humanity. Nobody questioned them. Nobody called them to order. They visit goats, chicken. This time I'm telling you that might sound ridiculous, but those military are not well fed. They are not well paid. They are not well supervised. What they do, they go on to steal goats. They go on to steal chickens, the neighbors. And the people that are there are not secured. If an individual is passing and accidentally wear a khaki, the person gets molested. They call you in, discipline you, maltreat you somehow. So don't be happy that the government are deploying army personnel to go there to calm the state, to calm the situation. It's not a very beautiful sight. I'm telling you, it's a living hell for the people that are welcoming, that are hosting those military personnel. It's not charming at all. I live some of those situations and I've seen it right-handed. I've seen the, the traffic these military personnel caught. You see, our military system, we, we're living in an analog, analog age. They cannot deploy electrical, you know, machineries to be able to dictate bombs or to be able to dictate some kind of weapons that individual use dogs, use cameras, surveillance cameras, set them, analyze every single package that every car is passing. They will not do that. So they employ these individuals. Okay. Let me tell you, the, one of the easiest ways to even fight corruption in Nigeria, easiest way, the first thing you need to do for, to take fight corruption, take away police on the street, is to introduce uh, automatic machines, automatic machines that control some of those cars, that count how many numbers of cars, that will give you numbers of cars that pass in a day, control them. If there's a place where, I went to a hospital recently, here in France, I went to a hospital, and I discovered that we're going to the hospital. There was an automatic machine there. This automatic machine opens gate, and the people that are paying for, to park pay automatically. They pay directly. This money goes directly into the account. So there's no policeman there. There's no military man there that will ask you, hey, give me 20 naira, give me 10 naira. So replace these military personnel with automatic machines. Replace them with modern machines. That's how we will advance. So I'm telling you this. I'm warning you, Nigerians, don't be scammed. Whatever this government is doing right now, the military, the army personnel that they deploy in jobs will not solve any problem. They won't do anything at all. They, they, it's not going to solve the problem. I'm telling you that the people of that community are living in hell because the army will molest the ladies that are there, the youngest that are there. They will sleep with them. They don't have wives to sleep with. They will sleep with the youngest there that are there. Some of them have sicknesses. They will infect them. They will maltreat the entire community. It's a living hell for them. So it's not a situation. So let's know the joys. And I, I do not belong to that school of thought. So, you know, those Nigerians that think that this, our government are not acting. I used to think like that. But then I discovered that do not underestimate Nigeria. This Nigerian government you're seeing, if they want to achieve something, they will achieve it. If that thing is in their interest, they will achieve it. Take for instance, if it is Borno State or or president, his village has been, you know, they are going through this crisis. I tell you, two hours is enough for them to solve this problem. Two hours. So it's not as if they are short of the ideas of what to do. No. They have the idea in their mind. They know exactly what they're doing. But they will not do it because it is not in their right interest. You need to understand that. It's very important. It's not in their right interest. First of all, they don't get anything from it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Remember, these military personnel, they like the crisis that is going on in the country. This Boko Haram issue that you're seeing that has been going on for a very long time, that is not finishing. These people, they don't want the war to finish because they make money out of it. The government deployed them, they allocate huge amount of money for them to go and go and go and go on a span and buy an ammunition. And they try, they try to keep looking for solution and the solution is not coming. They don't even fight the Boko Haram. They don't want them to die. <coughs> Excuse me. They don't want them to go because they make huge amount of money from it. So it's not a very charming solution that the government is providing. Yes, the president visited these locals, the vice president also, but he doesn't change anything. It won't solve the problem. So let's not be deceived. Let's not rejoice yet. There are still many more things that are coming and people are suffering. People are dying every day. So the best thing we're going to do, what is the solution now? Because we can't come in and complain and not be able to do anything. I'm telling you, the only solution now I see, there's no way is for us to come out and give our voice. Give our voice. Pressure the government for them to be able to do something. To be, You see, left to Buhari alone, he wouldn't be, even visit Plateau State, if not for the voices of people that are using social media to speak about. 
you know, they see some of these things because they know that it's not only Nigerians that are seeing some of these things that are online, but also people abroad, they see some of these things that we post. And what I told you that when I discovered that these people deleted my post twice, 2015 election, I made anti Buhari post, I made anti Jonathan post, and those posts were deleted. My account was suspended. I was like, really? I'm in France, and these people can be able to have access to my account. How can they be able to suspend my account? That was the question I was asking myself. Like, I'm not popular. I, I'm not, I, I don't know how many followers I have on Facebook. But why would my post attract them? That was the question I kept asking myself. Like, why would my post, my a trivial post I made, attract them? So they are watching. They are watching. They are listening to the things. They are, they are listening to our voice. You know, this is the only platform we have, Facebook, Twitter, and all those things, that we can voice out our complaint. We can voice out. We can, you know... Our, our discontent. So don't hesitate. Make posts, come out, make live videos, call them out until they find a solution. You can't be able to go on like this and don't be deceived. This military that they deploy will not solve any problem. They won't solve any problem at all in Nigeria. The people will suffer, the lockers will suffer, the young ladies there will be raped. And sadly, there's no any non-governmental organization that will be able to watch and to follow some of these things. That is the saddest part of all these things. Nobody will follow these things. They won't go around and see and try to question some of these military personnel. No, they will remain like that. So, and I then discovered that <clears throat> I was blaming Nigerians for being super religious, but then I discovered that this religion is actually the only thing holding some of us from breaking down because people are traumatized every day, killing, accident, and a lot of things are happening. People are dying every day. So I discovered that the religion, religion, why Nigeria are overly religious is because religion give them some kind of, you know, console them. So I stopped. I decided that no, I won't criticize this thing again until we find a very lasting solution. You know, so it's a very certain, yes, Prince Will, China no Prince Will is saying, Nigeria is getting worse every day because of lack of wisdom to use the gift that God has given us, both in the legislative house. Many of them are very weak in reasoning, and also they are supposed to go for retirement. <laughs> but they are still in office, just like Senator Abe, Abe Ribe reacted to the president for not, for not acting. Buhari elected some illiterate, <laughs> weak, and lazy in the office that is why we can't move forward that is true yes that is very true she didn't know prince will because that's very true and to be to, 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 to the, the funniest part is that buhari took time to elect some of these ministers he elected them he took six months to decide and when the list came out there was nothing impressive about the list of the people that he elected that he placed in the office the only person that is making sense in Buhari's government is emmanuel ibe kachuku the minister of petroleum that is the only man that is making sense the rest of them i don't have a very charming opinion about them so i'm really really sad that we have to come to this point now i'm thinking there is a curfew every evening. I have a friend who lives in Jaws, so the person told me that there is a curfew and they don't allow people to go out in the evening. So once it's six, seven, you don't go out anymore because if you go out, the military personnel, they, they, they get hold of you, they will maltreat you, they will deal with you, they will use cane to flog you in 21st century human being. The military personnel will lose cane to flog you because you break the curfew. They will maltreat you, they will ask you to do some frog job, you know. So it's just unimaginable. We're living like animals. We're living like animals in our country, in our home. So I, I don't really see how we're going to go. I don't see what we're going to do with this because that is not a charming solution at all. Yes, Aisha, Aisha is saying that what, we can just blame the government. People have choice. True, people have choice. They blame the government. Like I told you, we make, we talk. The government listened to us. If my post, my account was suspended because I made the anti-government post, it means that they are listening to us. Who, who is responsible that I, uh, doing that? I don't know. I was underestimating our military personnel and those EFCC. I was like, do they have the ability to even suspend or to spy on us on the internet? I underestimated them, but I was shocked when I discovered that my... I made the post, the thing disappeared. I, made the, I reposted it again, it disappeared. And then I continue, and then my account was suspended. I say, hey, how are they doing that? I was shocked myself. Yeah. 
So what do you think is the solution for Nigeria? As it is right now, he's electing the right government. I have few people in my mind that will make positive changes. And the first person that will become a president is Donald Duke. I, I believe in that man. He is a proactive person. Even though he made some mistake in the past, I've analyzed his government, his personality. I've seen that he is a visionary man. And I was telling, I just made a post recently ago. I said, Donald Duke should become the president of Nigeria and he should elect Omo, Omo, Omo Yele Showore Omo Yele Showore as EFCC minister because Omo Yele Showore is not a presidential. He's not, he sucks at leadership. He doesn't have leadership quality. He's an activist. He's like Robert Mugabe. You know, Robert Mugabe was, he militated against the, uh, what do they call it, the CC Rod government that were there. And he was together with Mandela and all this France Fanon and all these big, big African revolutionaries. So you might think that he would be good with leadership, but when he was given the power, he destroyed his own country. Zimbabwe is in shambles today because of some kind of mistake decision they made. So Omo Yole is like Robert Mugabe. They are just good at opposition. They are good at setting codes, like hard codes in the feet of the government for them to be able to work. So Omo Yole would do better as, a, as an EFCC minister, but in leadership as a president, I don't think he would do anything. He would make noise. He, I, I saw the interview he did with, with Dr. Sundi Adelaja recently. He was asked, what is your foreign policy about Nigeria? He didn't even know what foreign policy means. He didn't even know what to say. Like foreign policy, you are a presidential candidate, you don't even know foreign policy for your government. It's, it's as simple as that, me as an individual. I don't even know, I'm not even aspiring to become a president, but I can tell you that Nigeria has turned a huge position. Right now, Nigeria, as a giant of Africa, our foreign policy is supposed to be a regional domination. We are supposed to dominate the West African region. First of all, the maritime space is supposed to be dominated by Nigeria. We're supposed to develop our naval force. We're supposed to have a submarine ship submarines that can be able to to bought, to patrol some of our sea to patrol our territory not Nigeria, chinese people are coming to fish illegally in our shore they pack our fish and they take it back to their country and our government are not doing anything because our navy are ill-equipped they don't even have the materials how many ships do how many warships do we have in nigeria how many warships do we have just few one and they are even outdated they are not even active they are just packed there Soviet, since Soviet Union era, they passed some of those ships and gave it to us. They are not even active. So the military system, they need to be reformed, you know. You know, if I will be the person that will come in, the first thing I will do is to call every security personnel in that country, both from the police to the military, the army, the Mopol and everything. We're going to have a huge parade. There is going to be a total, a complete screening of all of them. They are going to go through a rigorous testing we're going to we'll make sure that we validate each and every one of them, take their number, because right now in our military system, there are ghost workers, there are ghost lists of military personnel. They don't even know completely how many people are there. If somebody can wear a military uniform and be walking around. Nobody can be able to tell if he's fake or not. So it's a very sad development. So Aisha, to answer your question, the solution to Nigerian government, to Nigerian situation right now is to elect the right leaders. And I'm not saying that the government alone can be able to solve this problem. We, the citizens, are, are, cap are more, very much more capable of solving this problem. I don't, I'm not the type that advocates that we depend on our government. No, I believe that I wrote, I made a post recently. That I say if we have 50 people or 20 people like Dangote in Nigeria, imagine what Nigeria will become. 50 people like Dangote handling different sectors, the agriculture, the production, and all that stuff. So... You see, governance is like football. It's like a football game. We're watching FIFA right now. I want us to reflect on that. Governance is like a football game. The government are the referees. They blow the whistle. They set the principles. They set the laws. They set the policies to govern a specific country. But the real players, of the, the real economic players are the citizens. So imagine a situation where we have 50 people like Dangote that they can solve the problem of Nigeria, employing millions of youth. You know, giving them job. So if this job, if this youth are employed, they will not be jobless, and therefore they will not even have time for toggery. So the citizens are the players of an economy. So I'm not the type that will blame the government and then leave the citizens. We also have a role to play in the advancement of our country. So it's a very sad development and seeing everything. So right now I kept thinking 
what those young children, young women will be going through with the presence of the army in just right now. They will be raping them every evening. Like I told you, those people are not, they are not with their wives. They are alone. They are being deployed to different parts of the country. To be a military personnel is not an easy task. They send you to, you, you'll be ready for mission in every part of the country. They send you, you know, so you go around and they rape some of these women. They rape them. They rape them. So I'm saying this, if any person, an activist who is currently present in Nigeria and can be able to raise this alarm, take an investigation and watch some of this system and be able to call them, to caution them. I don't know if that is even possible because there's no justice system in Nigeria. Even if they are caught doing it, there's no way you can settle it. So in the evening right now, business is stuck. People are going to work and they are being blocked in the traffic. They, get, they go to their work late. Students, they go to their school late because the military people are putting on traffic stops on in, in every part of the in every part of the village so it's not a very it's not something that we need to rejoice about so what Wuhari is suggesting for us is not a solution at all it's not a solution it's a huge scam and we should not sleep about that so make video make posts call this government out let's go on and bombard them until they look for a permanent solution like i told you they know the solution to to the crisis in the government they know exactly what they need to do but they won't do it because it's not in their interest. And like I told you, the military personnel are making money out of this crisis. They are making huge amount of money. They want the crisis to go on so that they get deployed, they get allocated, they allocate the money to buy ammunition to do other stuff. So they are not interested in this crisis to finish. The funniest thing is that it's only the citizens that are dying, but the leaders, the Muslims and the Christians, they are they are guarded. They have a get together together. They sit down, they drink, they eat, they have party. You know, they rejoice. You know, APC and PDP. But the citizens are busy killing themselves, the poor citizens. So it's a very sad development. So don't sleep if you're a woman, if you're a man. Think about those young ladies that are going to be raped by these military personnel that they have been deployed in the name of security. That is a, is a sham. It's not the real solution to, to, to this crisis. So this thing has been on for a very long time, since Obasanjo time, since Yaradua time. Good luck came in, he retired. Now Obawari is there. So Obawari will never look for a solution because the Fulani people are his people. And let me tell you, I've lived with these Flani people. I farmed where they live. They call their king Ardo. These Flani people, their king, they call him Ardo. So what is really, really fascinating about them is that they have a very high sense of organization. Forget about them not going to school. You might think they are primitive people, but they are very organized. Very, they are one of the most organized group I've seen in Nigeria. All these Yoruba, Nibos, and Hausas, and they're laughing at the Fulanis. They are very, very organized and very united. This is what happened in Jos, actually. And it, what is happening in Jos and what is happening in Benue State is that the Flanima will come around with his cow, with his AK-47 hanged around his neck. If that Flanima pushes his cow to your farm and you kill one of those cows and the Flanima retaliates and then you kill him, what will happen is that this Flanima, he dies, his family will report to the organization. If you kill one Flanima, 1,000 of them will come in and they will finish the entire community that killed that man. So these people, they are nomads. They don't use cars. They will travel from Nigeria to Senegal, from Senegal to Mali, from Mali to Ethiopia. So there is no, they, 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 4,000 kilometers, these people make it on foot. They make at least 50 kilometers a day. They rest with their cow. They find water, they give them. The next day they continue with their journey. So there is no way you can track them. They, are, they hide their guns in those cows. They hide those guns because they want to protect themselves from rustlers. They have to protect themselves from some of those guns. And it's a survival of the fittest. I've lived among them. I've seen the way they behave. I've seen their level of organization is very advanced. If those people are educated, they will be one of the, they will be one of the toughest and the most advanced group in Nigeria if they are educated with book. Because I've understand their cultural settings and the way their hierarchy, they are very, very, very organized. So it's no surprise that you see... And the Southerners, the Easterners, the Igbos, and the Yorubas are laughing at the houses and they're calling them primitive, uneducated. If I tell people here that I'm Hausa, they'll be like, oh, what are you doing abroad? You know, because you will never see Hausa man here. You will never see them in the UK. They always go back to Nigeria once they are done with whatever the business they are doing abroad. But they're laughing, but they don't know that these people have a single unifying factor, which is the religion. This Islam that you see that they have unify them a lot. And they know that they have to survive in the country. So there's place their people in strategic position to occupy the military posts, to occupy every other post, every single important post in Nigeria, they are there. Don't, not minding that they are not educated. And you, what you don't actually know 
is that they are sending on one 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 thousand candidates every year in the Hausa community. You see, most of the people you see in Nigeria, they call them. You see El Rofai, you see El Zagzaki, you see all those military, you see all those Hausa people that are, they have that name that, that that with L attached to their name. They are among some of those students that we are selected, carefully selected by the northern government to be sent abroad to be educated. Not just abroad, they have been sent to UK, they have been sent to Jordan, they have been sent to Egypt, they have been educated, they have been trained, they have been sent to Saudi Arabia. They bring them back to Nigeria to occupy political position, to occupy every big position. So there is an agenda behind. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm very much in support of that. I'm very I'm sure I'm giving them kudos because they are very visionary. But the rest of the group in Nigeria are not doing that. But they don't know what's going on. These people are sponsoring students, northern students, every year to study abroad. They are getting scholarship to go and study. So all those men, you see them bearing El Zazaki, El Rufai, El Mumuni, all of them, they are part, they, they are, they are, they are, they are they're allies. You know, they are, they are being sent abroad to study, to come back and occupy political position in the country. So that is another story for another day. But my concern today are the women that are going to be raped and the people, the victim of this community, of this crisis. So now they are traumatized with the crisis, with the killings and everything. And yet the military people that will come will not even give them peace that they deserve. So it's a very serious situation in Nigeria, which I don't know what to say right now. I don't really know how to react to it. Obasanjo was there yesterday and I don't see anything they can do because this thing is not in their interest. It doesn't interest them. So the right thing to do, the only solution right now is to wait 2019, take your PVC. If I have the opportunity to be in Nigeria, I will go to Nigeria. If they, if they can ask us to vote in the embassy here, yeah, I will go and do that. Take your PVC. Vote Donald Duke. Vote them into power. Because this Donald Duke, I've observed the guy for a very long time. I've seen his leadership quality, quality skills. I've seen that he's a visionary person. He tried that in with Calabar. But the mistake he did was that he implemented some project, but the project we are government owned. But this government will not, this project will not succeed if they are not privately owned. You know, all those Tinapa centers, he said, and all those story centers. If those stories, because the government that is coming in power, they are thinking of four years that they will spend and leave. So they will not think of how they will continue with this project. They will just come in and try to think about their campaign and how to siphon money and do all those things. But the best thing to do in Nigeria is to handle every single project, make it private. You see, when, when Dangote was building this refinery in Lagos, somebody was telling me, oh, that project will not go anywhere. I just laughed. I said, you are kidding me. That project will not go anywhere. Dangote collected $14 billion loan to build that project in Lagos. $14 billion loan in the bank. And you think he will allow the project to fall? Hey. If, he, if the project does not succeed, where will he get the money to pay? So the project must succeed eventually for him to make profit, to be able to pay back that loan. So any private sector project will succeed because the individuals are profit are profit driven. That is the mindset of private investment of private project. They are profit driven. So any government owned project, it won't succeed because those people look at our our what, what they call it. This our steel company, the Ajakuta Steel Company. It don't, it didn't succeed because it was government owned. I saw this woman was making noise recently that the government should take back the project. That they should not leave it in private hand. I just laugh. I say she doesn't know what she's talking about. It will never succeed. Put it in the hand of an individual, in the hand of an of an entrepreneur, of a capitalist in that country, Nigerians particularly, and see because those these these are private and they are profit driven. You know, so they will make sure that they succeed with that project, loan them money and tell them, pay back this money in the next five years, when the next 10 years, and see if they, that project will not succeed. So the Dangote project is succeeding. Why? Because it's a private sector and he's making his money. You know, so all these government projects will not succeed. They keep failing because the government do not have the interest in it. They are only thinking of how they will stay four years, eight years, and they leave. The next person that is coming is also thinking the same thing. So what Donald Duke did that impressed me was this Lafarge company is a, is a, is a French is a French company. They have a branch in, in, in Nigeria, so in Calabar. So when Donald Duke was in power, some of these cement company, one South African company came in that they want to establish their company there. And Obasanjo was in power then. So Dangote came in and Dangote said, hey, look, uh, don't allow this company, don't allow these South African people to establish their cement company here in Nigeria. Then Donald Duke asked him, okay, I should not allow him. This man is going to employ 700 youth to work in this company. I should not allow him. What will you do? Will you come and establish your own company here? And that was the end of the story. Then the next thing, uh, Obasanjo called, you know, all the big, big people, because Dangote was, was a favorite son in Nigeria then. They wanted his business to succeed anyhow. They called Donald Duke, trying to tell him that, hey, don't allow these foreigners to establish their company. But Donald Duke saw the vision. So he is not the type that 
has godfathers. You can, or if you claim that you're a big politician, you cannot manipulate him, you cannot suppress him to do whatever you want to do. But Omo Yolesho Ware can just make noise. He's an activist. He should remain an activist. So his best position, as I see, my personal analysis of the Nigerian politics, this 2019 election that is coming, is to put Shawari as an as EFCC minister and retain Emmanuel Ibe Kachuku as the petroleum minister because he's doing a wonderful job. And then put Donald Duke as the president because Donald Duke is visionary. He sees the vision and he is proactive. He's not reactive. So it's very important that we know some of this point. So the only solution right now, elect the right leaders, and these right leaders will inspire the youth, they will bring out policies, they will inspire other people. The only thing that Obasanji did that I like was creating millionaires, billionaires in Nigeria. He called in private sectors, empowered them, granted them loans, and most of them went into business. Most of them are, are oil tycoons right now. So that is the only thing he did that I was impressed with it. But the rest of the thing, he, it was rubbish. And he's making noise right now again to start up another party. No, 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 we won't take that. So go on, make sure that you make your vote 2019. The only solution right now, that's we, as we have right now, for now, make solution, voice out, post things, they might, you might think they are not viewing, you might think they are not seeing the things that you're posting, the things that you're writing, but they are listening to you and they will come for you eventually, just like they did to me. So since I discovered that, okay, these people are actually watching us, why not use this platform, continue voicing, continue, come out and speak about some of these injustices that are going on in the country. So yes, yeah, so come out 2019, make election. Yeah, thank you so much for passing by. Look, Trapaj, I see you. Your president is keeping himself moom. <laughs> and no action taken. I'm telling you, that man knows exactly what to do, Lude. He knows exactly what to do. But he won't do anything because it's not, it, it, the solution is not in his interest. You know, all those cabals that are there, it's not in their interest. They will never do anything positive because they don't see anything that they will achieve there, you know. So, but if they, if, trust me, I, I, was, I was telling myself that, oh, Nigerians, they don't have this, underground spy. I was, I was The only solution I was providing then about this Boko Haram stuff, I said, not a direct attack. Don't send military. Send me underground agent that they will make sure they infiltrate their network, get their names, target them one after the other and kill all their leaders. That was what I was suggesting. I would say, oh, Nigeria doesn't, doesn't even have that capacity of those underground agents or those secret agents. But I discovered that these people have them. Jonathan himself have people that are trained with snipers, big time snipers. You know, so, but then you will see that they won't employ them because they won't deploy them to do some of this because it's not in their interest. It's not in the interest of the military. It's not even in the interest of the government that Boko Haram stop fighting. So they are there particularly because the government want them to be there. If not, what, what is Nigeria? Just our border. We have four point something thousand borders that can be patrolled, that can be watched and tackle any individual that is passing but they are not interested in solving any problem. So don't think they know the solution, but they will never do anything. Lud is saying, I hope there's still a hope in Nigeria to be safe from poverty and killing solution comes first from government. Yes, I'm, I'm, pessim I'm optimistic about the future of Nigeria. I'm completely optimistic about the future of Nigeria because as it is going right, right now, people are getting fed up. People are getting tired of their government. They are getting tired of religion. They are already talking about it. Everybody is talking about it. They are tired. You see, something happened very sad. I was here during election here in France. The mayor always comes, she always comes to my house. There's an old man in the house. She will make him to vote because she was, he was her friend when they were young. So she, she was the mayor. So she will come and pick the old man and use his hand to vote in her cart to elect the candidate that she chose. I was like, I, I was saying myself, is it okay? This is Europe. Is it okay that she, she persuaded this man to vote her candidate? I was questioning myself. No surprise. Two weeks later, I learned that the woman resigned. Why? Because she gave her husband a contract. So I was like, oh, this man was corrupt. She resigned because the people of the community, this local, this, this, the village where I live, we're just 30,000 people. The people came out and told the mayor that she must resign. And she resigned eventually. Similar thing happened in Nigeria, in Nasrao State, with my mom. I called my mom. I said, hello, mommy, how are you doing? She said, she's fine. I said, what do you think about the governor of Nasrao State? Al Makura, he didn't even pay his workers nine months salary, up to 12 months. Can you imagine? How will the economy move forward if the people are not paid? Then I asked her, okay, your governor didn't pay you. How are you guys doing? What are you guys going to do now? Are you guys going to, what are you guys going to do? Then she replied to me, she said, oh, we're just going to pray. We will pray and God will take control. That was when I knew that we are finished. We are finished. Look, look at two examples. 
here in France, somebody was corrupt. The people called him, they called her out, and she resigned within two weeks. In Nigeria, the person is corrupt. They didn't call the man, and they are saying, God will take care of the person. I said, no wonder our level of development. We're not going to develop because of our mentality, because of our priority. So the way we handle issues, we did, you can see the clear difference that France is advancing because the people took law into their hand. They call out their government for them to be able to provide solution. When they are not able to provide solution, they resign and somebody take over the power. But in Nigeria, we see we are waiting for God to solve our problem. Ah, God gave us the power. He gave us the knowledge to solve our problem. We don't have to wait for him to do everything for us. God will not cook your food for you. He will not get your wife pregnant or he will not take your children to school. He gave you the knowledge to use them. He gave us, some of us, I was telling my friend who is suffering from depression, I said, look, don't pray. Don't pray. The only time you need to pray is when the solution is beyond human capacity. But anything that is not beyond human capacity, solve it. Solve it. Visit therapists. The, God gave them that intelligence for them to be able to provide solution to humanity. God help human beings to understand the mind of man to be able to provide solution to, to, to make you happy, to make you sane again, to make you regain your peace of mind. So make sure that you exploit some of these situations that are around. If you waste your time that you're praying for the solution, I think we're going to stay here for a very long time. Nothing will happen. So thank you for passing by. And keep sharing this video. I hope it gets to the right people. It gets to the right authority and people will see them. They will come out and denounce this callousness that is going on in Nigeria right now. I want to repeat this. I keep on, I want to repeat this continuously that the military stop. Please, anyone that is watching, share this video, share it wide, that the, this military that is deploying just is not going to be the solution. I'm telling you, the young ladies in the community are going to suffer from rape from the military people. I've seen this firsthand. It's not that I'm not a legend. I'm not saying it's a claim that anytime military people are deploying a specific community, they sleep with the young ladies that are there. They rape some of them. They steal goats. They steal cows. They steal chickens that are in the environment. They cause traffic. They molest the people completely because of the kind of training that they receive. They don't receive training to pamper people or to come and be laughing and shaking with people. They are being trained to be tough. So when they come, they find people, civilians, and they put their anger on them, their frustration that the government is not paying them well. So share this wide so that it will reach to our government. They will hear these our voices and be able to come out and say, okay, they will do something positive about this. So thank you for passing by. Let me read some few comments and see what people are saying. Hi, Ayako Ikoha Oberi. What's the topic? Yes, the topic is the killing. Where are you from, Ayakos? Are you a Nigerian? <laughs> Sorry. And Jen Marana joined and Chika Kachi joined. Casey Obesi, Sylvester, thank you guys for passing by. Hello, brother Abiola Olojo, thank you so much. And uh, talking sense, thank you, Ayakos. Yes, you're right, you know, Sanchika Kati said. Uzoma, <laughs> what are you laughing, Jefferson? <laughs> Why are you having to remove my cap? My hair is not very fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Stop talking about Shuri <laughs> in order for the Naduke. Let people vote who they want, not pushing one over the other. Anybody. Thank you. See, you have the right to your choice. Oh. But I'm telling you that, see, this show, already, guy, this guy is only good as CFCC minister. Trust me, if this guy is being given that position, he will destroy all those politicians you see in Nigeria. They are going to be all arrested. And the president cannot do that. It's unpresidential to do that. The, the responsibility of arresting all those corrupt politicians and bringing them to book is, and the right candidate for that is Omo Yole Showari. Even if he doesn't become the president, he's still part of the government as an EFCC minister. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying a bad thing. I've just, I just analyze his personality and I'm telling you that that is the duty. That is where he will be good. And don't, I'm not pushing Donald Duke. Nobody's paying me to, to do campaign for him, but I'm just telling you because I'm worried about my country. That is the only solution, electing the right people with the right mindset. And Showare, Homo Yole, Showare, as EFCC minister, mm, top and that country will be good to go because he will arrest every corrupt politician and he will do it with such ardor that even you yourself you come back and say oh innocent thank you <laughs> and she can say once anybody on top establishes institution no one else is allowed to come up near him yes that is true 
That is very true. That is very true. How can a country develop by stopping some people from establishing what other persons has already done? Yes, that's what it do. That's what it does. Yes, all this system, that we, all this the democratic system that we have, it doesn't work that way. In Africa, it doesn't work that way. The best thing I tell you, the best thing to do is to promote private institutions, to make sure that these private institutions are active. Like I tell you, 100 people like Dangote in Nigeria will change that country completely. So we, if, if as, assuming all these geos, all these big, big pastors in Nigeria are entrepreneurs, if they were capitalists, if they were, imagine all those their church members, if they were employed, you know, if that, that was a company, if, if, if it was all those churches were companies employing thousands of people in, in their company to work for them, we would have gone better, we would have gone far, you know. So it's a very sad thing to see that we don't have plenty of people like Dangote. Yeah, very interesting. Ayakosi said to say, wow, you know the agenda, of course. That's, they have known that their, their mode is operandi. I've lived in this community. I've lived with all these flanny people. I understand the way I live in the north, so I understand their, their personality. And I've seen the way all these military personnel operate. I, I can walk here in this country freely with Kaki or wash and wear. But in Nigeria, you can't do that. They will fight you. They will come back. They will molest you. They will make sure that they maltreat you. You know? So, Helen. The Duke guy is like Shore, but Shore has a good mindset. Shore has a good mindset, but he doesn't see. There's another. There's one thing that we need to understand. There's one thing. There's, there's one thing of you have the zeal and knowing exactly what to do. All these politicians you see them in Nigeria, they have the zeal. Before they reach to power, they have the motivation. Wow, I want to change my country. Wow, my country is suffering. I want to bring solution. I want to fight corruption. That was exactly what Buhari said. I want to fight corruption. I want to fight corruption. But how will you fight the corruption? You, they gave him power, power finally. How are you going to fight the corruption? Tell us how you're going to fight it. He doesn't know what to do. All he does is to go and arrest his political opponent or arrest those people that are stealing money. But that's, that, that is a short-term solution. The long-term solution is to put in mechanisms in place, to put in, to make sure that, because how did they take this money? Is to make sure that we have a cashless society. Let me tell you a few solutions for corruption in that country to introduce a cashless society, a cashless society, a society where there won't be cash flow, where we don't have palpable money, Naira working in the street. We we'll make sure that we digitalize every single thing so that any movement of money can be traced back. That is, that is we have to revolutionize the banking system and then to, to take up corruption on the street is to make sure that we take all the military and the security and those police that are collecting bribes bri 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 on the streets to replace them with automatic machines, like I told you. So it's one thing to have a good mindset, to have the will to be motivated, you know, and it's another thing to know exactly what to do, what to put in place, the right mechanisms to put in place. Like I'm telling you, all these politicians, they can be able to siphon money, they can be able to, to take them to another bank it's because there's no way to trust them back. There's no accountability. So first of all, we have to promote accountability. We have to bring, Trump said, Trump said the same thing. He said he never knew it was the hard to be a president, but the job has to be done. Yes, exactly. So they give, all of them have motivation. Then they will tell you, oh, we have, they all have good mindset. Even me, as I'm talking to you right now, I have a good mindset. If you put me there, I might be tempted to steal some of those money there, you know. But I won't because I know exactly how to solve the problem. I know exactly the solution to put in place. I know that human being will be... It's, it's like, let me give you one a good example. It's like putting a chicken and then put a guinea corn and ask the chicken not to eat it. The politician has seen money. Money is tempting. It's, it, you see, boku, boku. It's tempting to take it. Why? Because they are humans. They have personal problems. They have family problems. One of the family members want to get married. This one just gave birth. They want to do baby dedication. The other one wants to go to school. They need school fees. The other one, the family relation. The whole chain will depend on you as a politician to solve their problem. So, and you'll be tempted because the money is available. You see them, so you use them. So the best way to do is to make sure that they don't even have access to the money in the first place. So even if they, they're able to have access to this money, that the system is being controlled, that they can be able to trace back what they did with the money and ask them to give an account of what they did. And one of the most charming solutions that I think about this, solving this problem is what I call the, 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 the quality, what I call the, I don't know the word for it, but I, I, I prescribe same amount of salary for both the politicians and both the, 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 the civilians. So I say, if uh, if, a, if, a, if a civilian is receiving 100,000 as salary, the politician should equally receive 100,000 as salary as a minimum wage. Why? If we introduce such system, first of all, the people that are going to police are attracted into politics. 
because of the money that is there. So what you do is that if you remove the money as an incentive, it will discourage, it will dissuade all the thugs, people like Dino Melaye, I know this is the Abemori Bruce, it will discourage them from going to politics in the first place. Because first of all, the money is not there. Because you keep asking yourself, why we end up with thugs like the, like uh, Dino Melaye and the Abuhari in power? You ask yourself, why, how, did, how did this individual end up in power? It's because the money is there. So there are two incentives in politics. First of all, is the money, and secondly, is the power. So first of all, if you have the power, you don't have the money, what will you do? So take away the money out of politics and you see that only people with the right mindset will go into politics. People that are determined, people that have solution for the country, they will be motivated. People that are really genuinely motivated to come into politics will go. But if you leave the money there, so what I'm suggesting as a number one tool to fight, this way talks like Dino Melay into going into politics is equal salary in the country. Cut off all the benefit, cut off every incentive, cut off every monetary incentive in politics and see all those people that are struggling and clamoring that they want to go into politics, they will run away. Next year, call them, come, please, please, we want to elect you to become the governor. They will say, no, thank you, because there's no money there. They will not. And they will run. So cut this incentive, cut the money away, and you see that only the right mindset will come in. So three things I suggested. First of all, to fight corruption is to put in mechanisms in place, not human beings. Take away the police, replace the police on the street with machines, automatic machines that can be able to give accounts, that, can be, that people can be able to pay directly, and then revolutionize the banking system that everything will be digitalized, and that there will be ca cashless society, that they won't have cash money. People will not go into wedding and spraying money and dating the ground and dating the money. So we introduce a cashless society, and then secondly, we have equal salary. So three stuff, at least for a starter. So to any person that is going to government, this thing, if you introduce them, will be very important. So revolutionize the security system. Make sure you introduce a cashless society. And whatever you want to do, promote the private sector, promote private individuals. Those people are profit-driven. They will do anything to make sure that their business survives. Anibo, you can't tell Anibo man to close his shop. Anibo man is surviving on his shop. It is his shop, you know. So he can be able to decide, okay, I want to set up a franchise all over the country. And it will work. So all we need to do is to make sure that that's the only solution. So vote the right, vote the right candidate. Donald Duke is the only candidate I see for now. Artiku, I don't know about that one. He comes out and talk and give people all sorts of promises, but he's he's, he's not even he's not different from Buhari as I'm seeing him. Showore, Showore is a good candidate for ESCC. So come and tell him one day. I just send him a message. I say, look, you you're only good to become an EFCC minister. Don't even go for presidency. Just come out as EFCC minister. That's where Showore will do best. Put you there. Leave Ibe Kachuku to become the Minister of Petroleum and see wonders in that country. And Erofai, Erofai too, I don't know, you find a position for him. So those kind of people will put Erofai as foreign minister. They will do great, or not put him as vice president. They will do great job. So put, strategic, put people in strategic position, people with vision, people that can do stuff, and then you will see wonders happening in that country. So I still, before I end up this video, I still want to appeal to the people that are watching, please, share this video let it get to the right authority let them know that this military that are deployed in this local area are not good for the people it is not the solution young ladies are going to be raped they are going to cause traffic people are going to be molested like i told you the militaries are not trained to pamper the people they are trained to be tough they are trained to be rugged so once they are being deployed, what they do, they set up coffees in the evening. People no longer, there's no more activity. People live in fear. They can't be able to leave their house in the evening because the military people will harass them or they will even shoot them. I will tell you about a military man that I know, that I have seen personally because of 20 Naira. This thing happened in 2008. 20 Naira, he shot a driver. He was just there standing. He was like, give me money. Oga, what do you get for us now? Oga, boys, they're hungry. He was saying it. The military man says, sorry, you just gave him a ladle of pure water, a bag of pure water. He said, when we come back, we'll bring something. He said, oh, God, this is all you have. Oh, God, do something. Now. Boys are hungry. Oh, God, do something. The man just, the driver said, please, oh, let me go. He just kicked his car. He ah, look at this man. Oh. Before we notice, oh. he shot the driver. He shot the driver. The bullet pierced the door and hit the driver by the, on the lap. The driver didn't even die. But the military man was so afraid 
He thought he killed somebody. He then put the gun on himself and shot himself right on the street. And he died. The funniest part of the whole thing is that the youth of that committee, they were willing to lynch the, the, the military man that was there. They, they were irate. They pick up stones. They pick up tires. They wanted to kill the man. He shot himself. See, the man shot himself and died. So take this military person out of the street. Don't, don't, we don't want to see any military man in any part of the country. Nowhere. Put the, leave them in the barracks. Their duty is to fight abroad, is to protect our borders. Replace them on the street with automatic machines. Replace them with machines that can be able to dictate bombs on our road. Put tall girls in every single state that can be able to dictate, to be able to put radar, that can be able to analyze every single car that is passing. That is what you're supposed to do. Take the military, take the police people out of the street. Replace them with radar. Control the speed of the car. Control the content of every single car that is leaving every state. That is what you're supposed to That is the solution to this government. That's what they're supposed to do. So anytime you deploy these people, they are frustrated. And Nigeria with 200 million people, with only 120 something thousand, 125 thousand military personnel, that is not enough. That's not enough for the country of such po big population. Hmm? So 200 million people, and you're giving us a two, and you're giving us 125 thousand military personnel. Why in Nigeria? Nigeria, as a giant of Africa, is supposed to to be the regional power. We are supposed to be there. We are supposed to occupy West Africa. We're supposed to be the, the big brother of West Africa. We're supposed to be the big brother of Africa. We're supposed to protect the rest of the country in Africa. In everything, in security, in surveillance, we're supposed to carry out business. We're supposed to take them along with us. Hello, Miracle, Austin. I'm seeing you. Welcome in. So, yes, that is the role that Nigeria is supposed to play. That is, that is supposed to be our foreign policy. So the only way we can be able to do that is to make sure that, yes, we can move to a stability system and see that these things have been implemented. And then, okay. I was suggesting something to somebody. I was telling him that, look, the only way the only way Nigeria can be able to gain their respect right now, because Africa cannot Africa cannot develop without Nigeria. I'm telling you this. I'm not saying it because I'm a Nigerian. I'm saying because it is the reality. Because Nigeria is the conglomeration of all African countries. If you are from Niger, if you are from Senegal, if you are from Chad, if you are from Ethiopia, you can easily identify yourself with Nigerians. You understand what I'm saying? All those Sahara people, all those Aramaic people, all those uh, Chadic language speaking countries, they can be able to identify with Nigerians because there is a sector, there is a section of Nigeria that are houses. Yeah, of course, yes, 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 to militarize the, that's the, yes, to militarize the whole country, that is it. Taking the sample of our borders and make sure that the borders are well controlled. Disperse all these military people into the borders and protect them, not, don't leave them in the country because they are nuisance. They don't do anything. I was reading a book with uh, what Plato wrote. Plato wrote about military people. He said military, the security persons are supposed to be like dogs, are supposed to be like watchdog. What does the watchdog does? A watchdog pursue the enemy. If somebody is attacking your house, if somebody is invading your house, the watchdog pursue the person, attack the person. But the watchdog doesn't attack the people of the house. It protects the people of the house. And militaries and all our security persons are supposed to behave like the watchdogs. They are supposed to protect the citizens of the country and they attack any foreign country that is coming to tamper with our sovereignty. That is what they are supposed to do. But no, the watchdogs, our security people, have turned against us. They are now killing us. They are now maltreating our young ladies. They are raping them. So that is not the solution. That is not the solution. I still want to retain it. The military that are deployed in this region is not the solution. It's not the solution. Young ladies will be raped. They are going to be raped. So I'm saying these people will be like, how do you know this innocent? I've known this because I've lived in it. I've seen it. I've seen how they behave. They, they, they don't have the conscience. They don't have the human conscience. I've seen how my people suffered in my community, in my village. And there was a time my people fought with these thief people in Benue State. They took up. They said they wanted to destroy my village. They wanted to kill everybody there. It was a huge war. They got, the state government that time, they sent in military people. When they came, it was hell for us. It was hell. They came in, they raped everybody. They were killing our goat, killing fowls and eating everything. You can't even talk. If you talk, they, they will threaten to shoot you. One guy was just passing, he was just looking at them. They say, why, why, why are you looking at us? They told the guy to, to do some frog job. So it's not the solution. So don't be scammed. Let's not relax and say, oh, the government have deployed military people. Oh, they have found a solution. No, that's not enough. That's not enough. I'm feeling sorry for the young ladies that are going to be a victim of all this. 
the army people that are deployed there. So you come out, you voice out, you share these videos as wide as you can, and make sure that you get to the right personality, and make sure that you get to the media, and the people that can move. Okay, I, I actually lived in Aguatashi. He's in Nasra State. He's in Mobiloka government. Ayakus, yes, in Nasra State. So I lived there. I, I went for a holiday with my family. And that, that, that year that we went for a holiday in the village, that was the year that the chief people in Benue State attacked my own village. They came in with ammunition youth. They came in in trucks with guns and bullets. Who paid them to, who, how did they get those ammunition? I cannot tell. Unfortunately, we're in that village, but the people of that village were so brave. Why? Because they have been training already. Every single household in that village have a gun. So once a child is up to 12 years, they make sure that you have a gun in that family. So they make sure that they arrange everything and they provide you with guns. So they picked up guns. They, you, will see, you will see graveyard in people's house. You might think it's the graveyard, but, but no, they are guns stuck inside. That was what saved that village people. So they went in and dug some of those graves and removed some of them. Me like this, the only thing that, if, if my, some of my friends, if I open their body, you will see that they have marks in their body because they did the juju that bullet will not penetrate their body. They did some juju to protect themselves from bullet that we enter. But my mother refused because she was a Christian. She said, no, don't touch my children. Don't even give them any juju at all. She said, Jesus will protect us. That's what she said. So we were able to leave the village successfully without any attack, without us getting harmed. Because few, when we have, the, we have the opportunity, we say, ah, <laughs> we came for Christmas and the Christmas turned out to be a nightmare that some people are coming to attack us, to kill us. We ran, we left the village. I, I can't remember the last time I went there. So I saw secondhand how the military people were deployed, how they came in, how they kept raping every single lady in that. In the evening, you see young young ladies, they'll be calling them. They will be deceiving them with one one naira. You come in, they sleep with them. They give some of them diseases, you know. So it's a nightmare for any community when military people are deployed in Nigeria. So let's voice out, let's come out and talk against this thing so that the government will see and say, okay, they'll find a solution. They will do something differently in the country. So don't, don't be relaxed. Thank you so much for passing by.